Uh, we're excited to present tonight's program in partnership with Lewis and Salem Symphony. Thank you all for being here so much. We appreciate it. Um, I'd like to just take a quick moment to tell you about a couple of our upcoming programs. On November 10th, we'll pre be presenting Veterans and the Healing Power of Storytelling. In honor of Veterans Day, this will be a community conversation inviting the audience to experience the power of storytelling and healing process. And then on November 17th, we'll host the final installment in the Music of Winston-Salem Salon series. That is going to be Music, the Brain, and Medicine, <coughs> the Future is Now. The speaker for that will be Dr. Jonathan Burdett, who I believe was a former Winston-Salem Symphony board member, and also a professor of neuroaudiology at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center and co-founder of the Laboratory of Complex Brain Networks. That should be a very interesting program. Um, if you enjoy these programs and the exhibits that we present, please consider supporting the Winston Museum by becoming a member. We are 100% privately funded, and every gift makes a big difference. We have information on that out in our lobby. Finally, I'd like to introduce the leader of our panel discussion this evening, Robert Moody. Robert Moody has served as music director of the Winston-Salem Symphony since 2005, being only the fourth full-time conductor appointed by the symphony during its 70-year history. He has served as artistic director of Arizona Music Fest since 2007, music director of the Portland Symphony Orchestra in Maine since 2008, and began an appointment this fall as the principal conductor for the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. His most recent guest conducting appearances include the Chicago Symphony at Ravinia and the Los Angeles Philharmonic at the Hollywood Bowl, in addition to the symphonies of Toronto, Houston, Indianapolis, Detroit, <coughs> Seattle, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Buffalo, Louisville, and in Europe, the Slovenian Philharmonic. Summer festival appearances include Santa Fe Opera, Polito Festival USA, Brevard Music Center, Eastern Music Festival, Fort Opera, and Oregon Box Festival. Equally at home in the opera pit, Moody began his career as apprentice conductor for the Landis Theater Opera in Linz, Austria. He has gone on to conduct at the opera companies of Santa Fe, Rochester, Hilton Head, and the Brevard Music Center. He also assisted on productions of Verdi's Otello at the Metropolitan Opera, conducted by Valerie Gurdjieff. He debuted with the Washington National Opera and North Carolina Opera in 2014. Maestro Moody has accompanied many of the world's greatest performing artists, including Yo-Yo Ma, Isaac Perlman, Renee Fleming, Denise Graves, Andre Watt, Nadia Salerno Sonnenberg, Midori, Time for Three, and Chris Style. Everyone, Robert Moody. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see you all. I have a microphone on, can you tell? Can you hear me? I seem very loud in my own ear. Um, the, we're, we're glad that you're here, and the, um, the reason we're here is because of the year. This is, the, this is 2016, it's our 2016-17 season, and that makes it our 70th anniversary season for the Winston-Salem Symphony. I have in my hand one of the very important books. This is, this is a set of um, archives that come that are housed in the symphony office and this is the 1947 48 49 books it's the clipping of information from uh, that era from the very beginning of the time of the symphony <coughs> and it's interesting because I I opened it up and um, when you on the very first page I was just looking at this today the very first page there is a really wonderful and comprehensive article that tells you just about everything you need to know about the founding and the beginnings of the symphony. It's a very nice one page. It turns out I see that it was from the program book of the 1989-1990 concert season of the Winston-Salem Symphony, and it's written by someone named M. L. Kolb. I'm just trying to think who that might be. <laughs> Margaret Cole is the author of uh, this piece. And uh, so, you know, I say ask Margaret because she'll know more than me or maybe all of us up here on that opening. Um, the symphony started, and you can follow here in this history of Winston-Salem on one of these panels over 1943 to 1952. There's a photo. The photo is not from the beginnings of the symphony, but the information about the symphony starting. It started in 1946. The truth is, is that in the fall of 1946, uh, administration at Salem College wanted to um, somehow begin to formalize this group that already existed. 
I, I, I knew that something called the Civic Orchestra, and they didn't call themselves much beyond that, just the Civic Orchestra. I know that something called the Civic Orchestra had existed back to 1945, and just now, being in this uh, museum, watching a newsreel that was a, a promotion that um, Richard Reynolds made, I think when he was the mayor of Winston-Salem, a promotional, um, they would not have called it a video, but a TV spot or a spot, from 1942 actually references a civic orchestra in 1942. So we, we now know that going back even before, there, were, there was a group of people gathering and playing. I read in a number of places that this group actually had gathered under the direction of one of the leaders of um, Centenary Methodist Church. And he was also a conductor and he was gathering a group of players and calling them the civic orchestra and putting them together. But anyway, by 1946, by the fall of 1946, um, Charles Bardell, that name may be very familiar to you, he was the father, among other, he, among other things, he is the father of Margaret Sandusky. Margaret Sandusky, who at the right young age of, I think now Margaret's 93, is still an incredibly important person on the music scene, and she writes now the reviews uh, for the arts in the newspaper. But her father, Charles Bardell, was the Dean or the head of Salem College of Music, and he brought in a young man from Juilliard named James Lurch to sort of get things going and to get an, an, an orchestra organized. And so James Lurch got the orchestra together and they played a concert. They started rehearsing or gathering in the fall of 46, as best I can tell, but from the news articles, finally in March of 1947, they gave a first concert. On the first concert, they played one movement of a Beethoven symphony. They played the first movement of the Beethoven first symphony. And I have conducted the Beethoven first symphony uh, once with the Winston Taylor Symphony, and we did it down here at Gray Auditorium. So basically, near to where the first performance took place at Salem. So I'm glad we did that. They played um, a Mozart piano concerto. So they had a soloist for that concert. They played, uh, they wanted to play something new and modern, so they played the modern work to syncopated clock on that concert. And then they played the Beethoven Egmont Overture. The Egmont Overture has sort of become our signature um, historic piece for the orchestra, even predating me, my predecessor, Peter Perre, um, constant, consistently on the 50th anniversary, the 60th anniversary, et cetera, we have played the Beethoven Egmont Overture, really in sort of an homage to um, that first orchestra. So this was the beginning. James, James Lurch sort of got things started. It was a Wednesday night concert, March 19 of 1947. Um, James Lurch was involved for a, a while, and then it sort of turned over unofficially to a man by the name of Henry Sopkin, and Mr. Sopkin was involved as a conductor. And then finally, in the early 1950s, they thought they would try doing something unheard of, and that was pay somebody to conduct the orchestra on a more consistent basis. I'm very happy they thought of that. And uh, that caused them to bring in um, John Uly. And under John Uly's over quarter century of leadership, the orchestra really moved from that very, very beginning um, stage, uh, that infantile stage, into a mature organization. And then when his successor came along, Peter Perre, in the late 1970s, and his quarter century of leadership of the orchestra during that time, you really saw the orchestra become one of the you know preeminent regional orchestras in the country. And, and hopefully, not good in my now 12 years here, we have just kept evolving forward and doing great things with the orchestra. Uh, so that's it, four, four official conductors, five, <coughs> if you can count Henry, Henry Sopkin, and I think we should, but five conductors over a 70 year period, and a number of players who are sitting up here with me who have been part of many of those eras. So just, I'm gonna sort of do it by the, by the um, time that you joined the orchestra, but I will tell you that Dr. Bill McCall to my far left is with us and he can tell you stories about some of the early, not the very first year, but some of the very early days of the orchestra. And of the four players who were um, up here with me, um, the other three all still play in the orchestra. They're still incredibly uh, important members of the orchestra. Anita Serva, our principal trumpet, 
uh, joined the orchestra in the 19, uh, late 1970s, mid-late. Uh, after that, Ron Ruckin joined the orchestra in the clarinet section in the 1980s, and Tim Pattenbrock in the 1990s. So we have a little bit of each, um, many decades of when people began, sort of got, a bit, uh, got connected to the symphony um, here on the stage. I, I will first ask Bill to sort of take us back. I sort of walked us through 1946, 1947, but uh, Bill, talk about, if you will, talk about your recollections. Tell us how you began the symphony and what are any stories you'd like to share from then. And before we do, let me tell you that Bill, um, he joined the symphony back in 1950. He, this is when he began his residency in internal medicine at Bowman Gray. He um, actually has played first violin, second violin, and viola in the orchestra at times. He actually left the orchestra after 1950 because he went to um, serve in the armed forces. He served uh, during the Korean War and the Korean conflict. And after the Korean War, he came back and stayed as a, as a member of the symphony until the late 1960s. It turns out that his medical practice was crazy to think of, but it was apparently more lucrative back then than playing violin in the orchestra. <laughs> so, hard to imagine, but he has been one of our dear and beloved supporters and great friends ever since. So please welcome Dr. Will Paul. First, first let me say we didn't get paid until sometime in the late Hold that up, hold that up close to you. Can you hear me? There you go. There's yeah, there you go. Just hold it right up there. There you go. <laughs> Sometime in the late 60s, they started paying us for concerts. We never got paid for rehearsals or anything. But I think we started getting paid something like $45 for a concert back in the, back in the 60s. When we, about the time I was ready to stop, actually. Yeah. <laughs> when I began in 1950, I was just as he said, I was starting my residency at Bowman Gray that summer, and I entered it. In, had my uh, first contact with Lurch, and we, he agreed that I was good enough. I had an interview and everything, and he said I'd be fine to join the orchestra. So I thought I was going to be settling into a, an orchestra that I was going to really enjoy, and suddenly found out that the next spring the Navy called me back in, so I had to go off for two years as a physician in the Navy before and then the war. So this Korean War ended, and I started back all over again with the symphony in 53 and stayed with the symphony until sometime in the latter part of the 60s when my practice got massive enough, I should say big enough, that I couldn't get to rehearsals. And when you don't get to rehearsals, you shouldn't be actually going and playing at a concert. John Julie always said, come back, you can play. I said, no, you know, I'm not gonna play unless I can come to rehearsals, and it never worked out. He mentioned the fact that there were several interesting things about this early phase and that one of the first things I, that that first year, which was <clears throat> my year before I went into the uh, into the active duty again, uh, they asked me to play the viola one concert. I never played a viola in my life, of course I spent my life playing the violin. But the transition wasn't that great. I was able to do that and play for uh, at least that particular series of concerts. And when I got back, the other thing that I thought was fascinating is we were still young enough that there was times when Ken Smith, who was my brother, he and I from time to time, although we were in the first violin section, occasionally, I know at least twice, were asked to go and sit and play in the second violin section because the second violin, second violin section was absent from one body or two who were sick and they, were, they needed some support. So at that period of time, we were able to and asked to do different things, playing different parts. And actually, this was part of a growth, I think, that we all really enjoyed. It was fun doing that. It was fun being able to move around to different sections. Of course, was, we were very well stabilized in, in the few years that I have a latter year, particularly with Gene Jacobowski, who sat in the first chair of the symphony, first chair of violin, Charles Medlin, who was a wonderful cellist, who really also was a very firm and very important part of our symphony. Dr. Manzetta, who played the oboe, who was actually a wonderful oboist, and he was a physician, he was an anesthesiologist, so he didn't have to worry about coughing. <laughs> <laughs> but my practice 
got to be such a, and I love my practice, but it did take so much of time that I couldn't get to rehearsals. And, and the thing that bothered me most about rehearsals, I think, if anything, back then we didn't have an answering service. We had, a, I mean, answering machines. We had an answering service. We had a lady who took care of our calls. All of our emergency calls would come into this lady. So during every rehearsal, at least once, I had to go leave the front stage of the rehearsal auditorium where rehearsals were, walk back into the atrium where the only phone was, and check in with her to see whether I had an emergency or whether, or whether I had to leave rehearsal or not. Huh. And of course, that got to be also a problem because that was disruptive, and it was disruptive to me because I, we, usually I do this when we had a break for a few minutes, and so most of the time, just once during an evening. But uh, that's again another problem I had. You know, if you can't do the job properly, then you shouldn't do it. And I loved it, and still miss it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bill. So you, we're, we're going to give you guys a chance to ask some questions. I'm going to probe them for a few more uh, items as we move on too. But um, so, so Bill, 1946-47 uh, season one. Bill was there very early on, already starting in 1950. Uh, James Lurch, and then this new young guy, John Uly, and yeah. I, I think the best anecdotal way to tell about John is that really I think they felt the symphony was growing, and they wanted to they wanted to sort of um, in, increase the artistic ability. And Henry Sopkin had come on and was doing some work with them, and and Henry knew of uh, a um, trumpet player in the Atlanta Symphony who wanted to be a conductor. And so Henry said, y'all really need to get your get get this young trumpet player, John Uly, over here, because he wants to be a conductor, and he's, he's a strong musician, and he came. And I mentioned the trumpet part uh, specifically now, because um, uh, Anita began in the orchestra when John was still the music director. Um, I, I'm so happy that I got to meet John Uly and spend some time with him. I had some great um, times. He By the time I got to know him, he was near the end of his life, and it was difficult to talk to him uh, in a group setting, in a party setting. Um, but a few times I went over just to his house, which was just over there by uh, Nolwood Baptist. He stayed in a little place there, got to spend some time alone with him. And he had pictures uh, around his house, big, big pictures from uh, something from Tanglewood and something from Music at Sunset over at Grayland. And, and uh, if you pointed to the picture, he could immediately start telling you stories about it. And I really. I'm half so happy for that memory. Um, Anita, you got to play with him, so I think you got to know him really in his prime in a, in a way very different, you and Bill both. Anita, to my far right, she is the principal trumpet of the Winston Salem Symphony, also the Greensboro Symphony, also the Piedmont Chamber Symphony, also my Arizona Music Fest Festival out in Arizona. She graduated from the North Carolina School of the Arts. She then earned her master's degree at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And while there, she got a chance to play with the Cleveland Orchestra. She performed with them in Severance Hall, also at Carnegie Hall. Um, she studied with some of the great trumpet teachers, Al Dean, Ray Mays, Bernard Adelstein. Um, I'm trying to tell you what else is on her wonderful bio. She, uh, of course, has a great trumpet studio. She's a part of Giannini Brass, Spectrum Brass, uh, quartet, uh, your wedding music, uh, summer festivals. She's played at Eastern Music Festival, Blossom, Brevard Music Center, North Carolina School of the Arts International Music Program. Uh, a lot of great trumpet and organ recitals, including with my partner Jimmy Jones. Um, recitals up in Portland, Maine, uh, a couple of years ago on the um, Keenan Chapel at Landfall, Wilmington, North Carolina, and music for a great space in Greensboro. So. Um, she's really uh, just a huge part of our family. Welcome, Anita Serpent. That's a lot of stuff I've done. Um, when I was in 11th grade, I had a, well, from 5th grade to 7th uh, grade, I had a woman trumpet player as my band director in middle school. And she, unbeknownst to me, was, was uh, taking me from another room in her house as I was having a lesson that day. And she sent that tape over to the School of the Arts. And I got into the School of the Arts by that tape. Um, and I was playing the back of the Arts book and all this stuff I had no business playing back then, but I wasn't afraid of it. When I was at the School of the Arts, I don't know how this happened, but someone said and mentioned the Mary Starling auditions. 
Well, my, I didn't have a car. We, my family and I were very, very poor. And so my mom and dad would always come pick me up for every rehearsal, every performance. And during that time, I, John Uly was in the audience. And I just thought, I, don't, I didn't really know what I was doing. I, felt, I had a deep flat trumpet to my name. I didn't own any other trumpets. And I went just reluctantly, happily, I guess, over to the, to the middle of the auditorium. I auditioned. I did not win, but I was first alternate. And as soon as I was walking off the stage, John Uly ran up onto the stage and said, I want you to be my second trumpet player. And that's how I got in the symphony. Mm -hmm. And I, have, I loved John Uly, first of all, because he was a very famous musician. He was a trumpet player. He had been a conductor in Atlanta. So I respected this man immensely. Um, he was kind of like a father to me during those years. And the experiences that I had with him down in the pit at Reynolds Auditorium playing Nutcracker. I remember those a long time ago. Grayland, out of Grayland, the music at Sunset concerts, and then out of Tanglewood concerts. There's a lot of stories between that and he and I. And I, when he died, his daughter sent me all the letters that I had, had written to him, thanking him for the experiences that he had given me to be in the orchestra. And she returned all those letters to me and were priceless to me to this day. Um, after he left, you know, of course, I went to, uh, well, I was I went to the, as, as, as Bob already said about going up to Cleveland, um, went there for two years. Then I came back and I auditioned for the Winston Center Symphony again. I mean, I say I've been in the orchestra since 11th grade, but I did take that two year hiatus. And I uh, came back and it was really fascinating to see all the wonderful musicians the Clarion Wind Quintet, Bob Lestokin, uh, uh, Fred Bergson. Um, Mark Hopkin. Um, I don't know if Joe Robinson was playing in the orchestra or not, or, Ma or Max Rieger, uh, Vance Rieger. And of course, Phil Dunning was in the orchestra. And these people really inspired me to listen. I listened to Bob Lestoke and played the clarinet, and that's how I learned to play music. Because I listened to him play, and it just, he just sang through his instrument. All of these amazing people I have had a chance to listen to. And even now, all, they're all out of the orchestra. Some of them passed away. Some of them are still in town. They still come to the concerts. Um, very, very amazingly. I love that about these people. Um, when Peter Perret, when I auditioned, Peter Perret was the conductor. He was at, at the orchestra the two years I was in Cleveland. And by chance, by chance, this is all God's will. I'm telling you, I could write a book. But Barry Boggess used to play principal trumpet with another girl who split the book on first trumpet. Barry did not want to be in the orchestra anymore. So he left the exact time that I left the Cleveland Institute. And I came and auditioned for the Winston Sound Symphony in 1982 and won the principal spot because all the clarion went, you know, quintet guys were there. Again, they were there and I had just such an amazing experience with them. And of course, Peter Perret was there for 25 years. He was like the grandfather of the, of, the, of the orchestra. He was like another father to me. He was very sweet to me. Um, and I learned a lot from Peter Perret. He raised the orchestra to a different level. And um, I was going to say, with what Bill said, Bill said he didn't get paid. Well, my first paycheck in 11th grade was $11 mm -hmm. to play in the symphony. And I still have that contract. <laughs> um, then, of course, Peter left, and of course, Bob Moody, the famous Bob Moody, is here, and he has inspired this orchestra to greater lengths, and very inspiring man. And the orchestra has learned a lot of respect for who's up in front of us, and we learned a lot of musicality from Bob, and this orchestra has grown tremendously with the, with the, uh, the charisma, should I say, that Bob has with his audience, and with all the musicians. So that's kind of my Reader's Digest version of my, my story. I have lots more to tell you, you want to know. <laughs> well, I, at some point, I'm just going to ask all of you, know, who is your favorite conductor? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> so, so Anita first connected in the 1970s, and it's a really great story to hear about the times with John, and then, of course, with Peter. and. Um, Peter Perret, my predecessor, um, I actually just did a talk with Peter at lunch today. Um, Peter is still very active in the community and uh, is a great, great colleague, of course. And I think Peter was the person uh, who, who was around when Ron, both Ron and Tim got started. So next I'll introduce you to the person to my immediate left, 
That's Ron Rudkin. Ron is one of our fantastic clarinetists. Also a phenomenal saxophone player, flute player. I don't think I really knew this part. I always think also, I've seen you many times sort of just make your way over to a keyboard. Also a phenomenal keyboardist, jazz performer, band leader, arranger, uh, orchestral chamber musician. Um, he's a professor, of course, at UNCSA, just down the street. He's the head of the jazz program, teaches music theory there. Um, he's, he's our associate principal and second clarinet of the symphony. Um, he's played with jazz groups all over North Carolina and uh, many prominent jazz musicians, I would say, uh, you know, around the planet, in including we get to play with a great one, big band type jazz person coming up just in the next couple of days. Another trumpet player, Doc Sevenson. Please welcome Ron Rutgers. So it, it's interesting how history repeats itself because I played uh, in the National Symphony in Tennessee with Doc Severinsen uh, in the late 1970s before I came here. And uh, I will never forget that our uh, symphonic conductor, as opposed to a pops conductor, conducted this pops concert. And Doc Severinsen brought his own rhythm section with him. So he had a drummer, bass player, guitar player, piano player. And they all do this music, they do this tempos, and uh, I, I don't think that, 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 I don't remember who was conducting at the time, but uh, I don't think he'd done a lot of pops conducting. <laughs> but I will never forget, he gave the downbeat, and as soon as he gave the downbeat at the rehearsal, this is the first thing that happened, the drummer immediately came in and started going, doom, ba, doom, ba, doom, ba, and that was the tempo. <laughs> and the conductor tried to conduct the drummer to his tempo. <laughs> that was not going to work at all. <laughs> so that was my first experience with Doc Sevens, and I look forward to seeing him uh, this weekend. Um, so just a couple of things I'd like to mention. Uh, it's really interesting, uh, having been in the community and having been in the symphony now just over three decades, I guess, for me, and so there's a lot of overlap with different people who've been in at different times and then out and what have you. Um, just so you know, my, my first instrument was the saxophone and I was always attracted to jazz and really wanted to be a jazz musician, but I had a, a teacher in high school, a private teacher, who uh, gave me great advice about uh, being a musician and one of the first pieces of advice he gave me was, uh, if you're going to be a jazz saxophone player, you need to learn how to play clarinet, and you need to learn how to play flute, and you need to learn how to learn, learn to play them extremely well so that if you walk into a gig with just your clarinet and play, all the other musicians will assume that you're a real clarinet player, not a saxophone player who does what we call doubling on the clarinet, which means that the tone is not as good, the intonation is not so good. So I was always very, very serious about playing clarinet and flute well, in addition to playing jazz saxophone. So my first teaching job was in Tennessee at the university, right out of my master's degree. And within a year, the National Symphony, which was in driving distance, had a, an opening on bass clarinet and clarinet. And it had never occurred to me to be a symphony musician. I just thought I would be a jazz musician and play clarinet and flute you know, along with saxophone. But I took the audition and I won the audition. So I played for three seasons with the National Symphony, which is also an excellent regional orchestra. And then after I came to Winston-Salem in the late 70s, within, uh, oh, about five, six years, the young woman who had been playing bass clarinet in the symphony left the area, and that position became vacant. And so I started playing bass clarinet, and third clarinet first with the symphony, which I did for a few years there. And then, um, uh, when the second clarinet position became vacant and Bob Ostokin was kind of uh, bringing his better students in to play second clarinet on this concert and another student to play second clarinet on that concert, uh, that went, uh, was good for the students. It wasn't so good for the stability of the woodwind section. So uh, eventually I talked to Bob Ostokin and I talked to uh, Peter Bure and I said, I would love to play second clarinet. And so I moved up to second clarinet where I've been ever since. And of course, when Bob first came here, he knows that we really didn't have a principal clarinet player because uh, Bob Ostokin had long retired from the orchestra, and uh, our, our then uh, principal clarinetist, Nathan um, Williams, 
moved away from the area. He was a wonderful clarinetist, but uh, uh, he moved away, and so I actually played principal clarinet for the first season that Bob was here, or two, uh, and then eventually um, Anthony Taylor, our, our clarinet player, uh, came in. Uh, he, he and I, uh, I just, I, I, don't, I assume he thinks something along the lines, but I think he and I make a great team. I love working with him. He's a, he's a brilliant guy and a great musician. And so when we're in rehearsal, we are often talking about what's going on in the music around us other than just our own parts, because we're both very interested in hearing um, you know, what, what else is going on. And in fact, when I was a very young man, I was in my early mid-20s playing in the National Symphony in Tennessee, and it was like uh, just light bulbs going off above my head all the time because I'm sitting in the middle of the orchestra and I'm hearing all these great things going on that these composers have written that I've studied about as a student, but now I'm experiencing it for the first time and it was just a, a, a truly amazing thing. So um, beyond that, that's how I became involved with the orchestra and, and of course I've always loved playing with the orchestra. It's an entirely different challenge to play classical and symphonic music than it is to play jazz. Entirely different. I mean, obviously, depending upon what kind of jazz you're doing, there's some precision and reversal involved. There's a lot of spontaneous creativity in the improvisation part. Uh, well, you can't just stand up and start playing a solo in the middle of Beethoven 9. <laughs> it doesn't work so well. So you have to stick to what's on the page. Uh, and it takes Really, to be, to be a wind player in an orchestra takes a laser focus that you almost get in a zone where the, your brain is focused on that page and the conductor and counting every measure of rest and making your next, next entrance and playing it in tune and rhythmically precise and musically and in good ensemble with all the other players. Uh, you can't let that laser focus slip for a second because if you do, you'll get lost, and you won't know where you are in the piece. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really critical thing. So with that said, I just want to make one other uh, uh, sort of broad comment about the, uh, the evolution of the Winston-Salem Symphony. You all know that Winston-Salem is one of the bright stars of um, arts in America. It's the first arts council ever, and there always have been uh, progressive leaders uh, in this city who have looked ahead and have built uh, a solid foundation within all kinds of institutions, among them, of course, the Winston Salem Symphony. And that has been critically important to how well this orchestra plays today. So we're going back decades there of people who really understood the importance of the arts and did everything that they could to bring about a great arts <coughs> community. That said, one of those things that was brought to the area in 1965 was the North Carolina School of the Arts. And since the North Carolina School of the Arts came, and my colleague uh, on the trumpet over here already addressed this, right away the Clarion Quintet began playing principal positions in the orchestra, and then eventually uh, the string, the three members of the string quartet, Sally Peck on viola, Bob Marsh on cello, and uh, Elaine Ritchie on violin, became principal uh, uh, cello, viola, and concertmaster, only played concertmaster uh, during the 80s, I think. And uh, Bob Marsh had been principal cello of the Atlanta Symphony, principal cello of the Dallas Symphony. These were really, really high level players. Um, and Lynn Peters played uh, principal bass. In other words, it became a tradition for faculty at the School of the Arts who were extremely high level players to play in the orchestra. And then eventually, as the years went on, uh, people who graduated from the School of the Arts uh, joined the orchestra. And the fact that the School of the Arts exists is a, I think, major factor in how good an orchestra this is and how well it plays. Today, of course, we have Paul Sharp down there on principal bass controlling the whole bottom of the orchestra, and we've got Brooke Whitehouse playing uh, principal cello, and uh, you know, just all, all the great musicians, both faculty and 
some current students occasionally, but a lot of alumni uh, have played in the orchestra. And you probably, many of you are aware that in the bigger cities, in New York, in Philadelphia, Cleveland, Chicago, it's that orchestra that provides the full-time employment for the greatest musicians who live in those cities. And then the schools, the conservatories that exist there, like Juilliard uh, or, or the Cleveland Institute, wherever, they are the beneficiaries of all these great musicians who play in those great orchestras. So those people go and teach part-time at the local conservatories. Here, it's the exact opposite. We have the school as sort of the primary employer, and then the orchestra is the, is the beneficiary. So uh, it's been uh, just a, 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 an incredible thing um, to, to play in the orchestra and to see the growth both under uh, Maestro Pere and under our current maestro. The orchestra has continued, uh, I think, every season to, to move forward and do more interesting things. Um, I, I want to make one final comment, if I may, about Bob Stoken um, that Anita mentioned. I sat there and watched everything Bob Stoken did for years until he eventually retired from the orchestra. And just from watching him, and of course listening to him, I learned so much, it was unbelievable. I, mean, I had played in Nashville before that. The principal player, player was a little of a looser guy. Uh, Bob was just a, just a spectacularly fine musician. One of these musicians that I've always thought, uh, it, it doesn't matter what instrument they play, the music is gonna come through that instrument, and the instrument is not a hindrance. The music is gonna be there. And someone I would say that about now is our principal oboe, Saxton Rose. Uh, oh, Buster. bassoon, or principal bassoon is Saxton Rose is such a phenomenal musician that it almost doesn't matter that he's playing the bassoon because the music that comes out of this, of course he has impeccable control of the instrument, um, but Bob Osoken was just a, a, an incredible, incredible musician. And uh, I was uh, very lucky to have sat next to him for several years. So that's that's mine. Yeah, that's excellent. I, 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 I've heard so many stories about um, Bob, Bob Osoken, and I, of course I did get, I get, did get to conduct Mark Hopkin for a few years, um, but I, I'm, I'm always jealous of that era when that that quintet was so active at the School of the Arts and acting as the leader. leaders. I was, I'm happy to, to note, to, uh, to note also that I'm so proud of what we've done is those members left one at a time. They didn't leave as a quintet. Uh, same thing with string leadership. People left one at a time. And I'm so proud of the way we've been able to keep making sure that we basically honor the person who went before by hiring someone who just kept raising the bar. And that that's a really... That, that's, that's how it should be for, I, all of us should wish that the one who comes after us is better than us. You know, it make, makes us, it makes the institution look better in the years to come. Um, so, uh, 1950, 1970s, 1980s, uh, to my immediate right is Tim Pattenbrock, he joined in the 1990s. Uh, he's been, I, I'm reading now the 22nd season with the symphony. 22 years ago, it was still the 90s. <laughs> the 22nd season of the symphony. Um, he's, uh, I'll let you tell about sort of positions, and the horn positions you've held in our symphony. He's also a third horn in the Greensboro Symphony, plays in our winston Salem Symphony Brass Quintet, which does a huge amount of our Mary Starling ensemble programs in the schools, among other things. And he's also first horn with the North Carolina Brass Band. And it's also like, where are you from originally, Ron? College Park, Maryland. So Bill, Born here in Winston Salem, Anita Greensburg. in Greensboro, this area, Maryland, and Florida native. Welcome, Tim Pappenbach. Yeah, I, I was raised in Jacksonville, Florida. My parents were symphony musicians, then my dad was principal cello of the Jacksonville Symphony. That, as it was kind of emerging from being a civic orchestra into being a more serious orchestra. But that being said, I, I didn't play any instruments. Didn't my brother was very musical. I, I quit piano very early. Didn't, I wasn't as good as my brother at it, so I just didn't stay with it. And I got to, uh, got to, we used to be junior senior high, now it's middle school, but I got to seventh grade and wanted to pick an instrument. Um, so I spoke to my symphony parents and said, I want to play the euphonium. 
That's about the response I got. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I had just kind of kicked it in the shin or something. They, they weren't going to have it. And so they said, well, maybe, uh, you know, and I think they might have even suggested trumpet. And I said, no, everybody plays trumpet. And, and my, my best friend was going to be playing trumpet. And so I, I ended up picking up French horn. Didn't know very much about it. Um, ended up taking a liking to it and, and got Later on, as I was in 10th grade, leaving 10th grade, I was spending my second summer at the Bar Music Center. And I can honestly say that that place changed my life because you're so submerged in music everywhere. You wake up at the crack of dawn and you're in theater class at 8 a.m. And to somebody who's not in a music conservatory environment like school of the arts, that's, that's quite a shock. You're in rehearsals all day, then you're either attending a concert or playing a concert that night. And, uh, so I was there, uh, this is my second summer at Bavard, and a girl that I was close to came to me and said, I'm gonna play an audition, there, 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 there's, there's a school here that's auditioning people. There's a small guy school here, I've never heard of it. Um, so I said, why not? You know, so I played an audition for them, and I guess they needed some horn players, because they, they picked me up right off the bat, so I called my mom, and there was no cell phones back then, I'd wait in line for, for the pay phone. <laughs> the Bavard, and it's kind of this little and put your quarters in. I said, hey, mom, guess what? I'm going to move to North Carolina. <laughs> she didn't like that at all. Uh, but, but I did convince them to do it. They did a little looking into the school. Um, and so my 11th grade year, I um, up here, moved to Winston-Salem. And uh, Fred Bergstone was the teacher there. He was principal one of the orchestra for at least 30 years, I'm guessing. And uh, he was fantastic. He had a, a complete second father to me. Really took me in and, and you know, had a great time. Get to about, I, I done about, I guess, my second year of college when finally there was a, a, an opening just to play the Summer at Sunset concerts. And a, lot, a lot of the principal wind players would be off the conservatory at summer festivals doing their thing, so there were some openings to play the summer concerts. I think it might have had something to do with the fact that it's usually 98 degrees, <laughs> and some of the wiser, older veterans of the 70s knew to get out of those concerts. But, but so I started summing in the group then, and then went off for a year, did a uh, National Broadway tour of South Pacific, which was fun. But when I came back, I uh, kind of settled down, had, had a family, and then then got actually a, an appointed spot in the symphony as a, a assistant principal horn. But for those who aren't in the, the orchestra, assistant assistant horn's a little different than assistant cello, perhaps, because assistant cello plays everything like the cello section does. Assistant horn is a little bit of a, it, it's more of a head game, because you spend a lot of time sitting and listening to your principal player play all the stuff and you wait your time. And, and basically, it, it, it's designed so that the, you know, the French horn, unlike the trumpet, plays when all the woodwinds are playing, the French horn Brass is playing, the French horn is playing. So, in most orchestras now, it's pretty standard to have an assistant. And the assistant kind of helps out on loud stuff. Maybe we'll take a note or two during a solo just for a, a split second, you know, reprieve for the, for the principal player. And so, I did that with my teacher slash father figure for, goodness gracious, I, I, it had to have been about 10 years. Um, and that, that's a little bit of a, a try, because you, you, you hear it stuff, you want to be, it's like, coach, put me in, I want to play. But, but you still have your role to play, and so you, you learn in time. And, and to be able to, to play assistant to such a great player as Fred Bergstone taught me everything. And then when Fred finally retired, we, we had some auditions, and I finally got into the section. And uh, for a while, I was fourth horn, which is a whole different ball game. Uh, low stuff is, is you know, horn players cover the whole range no matter what, but some specialize in high stuff, some specialize in lower stuff. And I always tend to go towards the higher stuff. So uh, now I'm pretty comfortable on third. And, and uh, I lost my train of thought there. But, uh, oh, oh yeah, back, back to, we, we kind of talked about Bob Lestoke. Uh He was was right next door to Fred Bergstone at School of the Arts. And uh, I had the opportunity, he, he was my woodwind uh, coach. So we, we all had women quintets. He would, was so gifted with the clarinet, um, much much like you're saying, Saxon Rose can kind of sing through his instrument. Bob Stone was the same way. And and a couple of a couple of things that both Fred Bergstone and Bob Stone taught me. Um, 
but the best quote was from Fred Durst, and he says, good orchestras can play loud, great orchestras can play soft. And, and that's so important to learn, because when you're a 20-something year old and you're playing the orchestra, you, you're all about the loud stuff. That's the soft stuff. And French horn, with the exception of the clarinet, French horn can play softer than any other instrument. When, when done properly, it, it, it has to do with the smaller pore size. It just doesn't take quite as much air to produce a sound. So it, that was one thing I learned from those guys is, you know, have fun with the loud stuff, but take special care on the soft stuff. And the other, and this is a, a good quote from Fred Thurston, we had just played, uh, this during the Peter Bray day, so we got Procopia 5, which happened to be Bob Newton's audition piece, which we're gonna get to in a, a bit, but uh, we're doing Procopia's Fifth Symphony, and it's got the melody, da 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 goes up to a high beat line. The horn only gets that solo once, and so, it's about, you know, about a third of the way through the first movement. And Fred played the concert, I said, great, great solo. And he looks at me and goes, what solo? And I hummed it for him, he goes, oh, that, yeah, that's only a solo if you miss it. <laughs> <laughs> there could not be wiser words, because he, as musicians, you know, even to this day, and I don't know about you, you can still, nerves could still play a, a big part of the concert. And uh, to know that, you know, if, if you think, oh, I've got a solo coming. That's not the way to approach it. You, it. When you're all part of the team, and this kind of gets back to what Ron was saying, you can get caught up listening to, and I sit almost directly right behind Ron, so I've got all the principal wins right here. I've got the best seat in the house. I mean, I really do. Um, to, to be able to hear what's going on and, and not get caught up in it so that you do remember when you come in for your stuff. And uh, hey, it's just a great experience. I, th I think we all can say we've got the best jobs in the world. It's, it's fun to do what we do, and, uh, and, it, and it keeps getting more and more fun. Um, I worked at a retirement home for about eight years for the Village, which is a pretty well-known retirement community, and they're good supporters of the concert. They have one of the buses that comes, and, and, and you know, anywhere from, from 15 to 20 people would be for, for the concert. And so when we're going through, when Peter was, was stepping down, and we're going through our audition period, Bob, Bob maybe was the, he was the first one, which is either a good spot or a bad spot. It turned out to be a very good spot. Um, he also was doing Procopia 5, but uh, it, after every concert, everybody at the time would go, who do you like? Did you like this one? <laughs> and so uh, one of the things that was really neat, one of the things that Bob has brought to the orchestra is the, the, these other pieces we get to do. Um, so I, most of them I never heard of. There's a Theophilus, I forget his name. Uh, uh, the the, 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 yeah. He does some fantastic stuff. I would have never thought to listen for it. Um, and his first concert opened the piece uh, Sierra. I can't remember. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mar yes. Yeah, the dance song. Yeah. Really, really, really. Yeah. Well, then it was another concert. But uh, <laughs> there was a piece. Uh, I want to say the guy's name was Sierra. The piece was Sierra. <coughs> meant to look it up. And, and one thing we do get is uh, our concerts are recorded by Frank Martin. And uh, much like the football team, the Panthers will go and review what went wrong on Sunday. Well, I, I get every take, just about every take, and I review. Um, that mostly because from our perspective, what we play, you know, from where I sit, oh, I just horn. And I hear horn. Like you would believe it, I love it. But that's not necessarily what the audience wants to hear. So it's good to have the tapes to be able to go back and, and kind of listen to what the whole balance sounds like. And, and you do get here. We, we can always hear what the strings are doing, but we don't hear anywhere near as well as we can with, with or as well as the audience can hear. So one of the things I was going to do was go back and look at this tape and find out what that piece was. Yeah. But uh, some, some of my Frank Martin CDs have, have fallen into cracks and crevices. I need to get it back. It, you know, when you first start out, you, your first, you, you, it used to be cassettes. Um, I don't know if Frank ever did real, real with yeah. anybody, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I get these cassettes, and uh, before you know it, you've got a big stack of cassettes. And, it, and it's kind of neat, I, I keep saying when, when I have grandchildren, I'm going to you know, sit them down and make them listen to every darn concert. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've got to keep, keep track of them all, and I don't think the cassettes play anymore. Thank goodness for moving the CDs. But, but yeah, that's it. We, uh, the, one of my bucket list, uh, one of my wish list items for the symphony is that actually we do have in storage, going back into the 1960s, I don't think we go to the 50s, but going back to the 60s, we have most every classics concert uh, recording, and it's in storage, and all of the early recordings are reel-to-reel, -reel, 
and we then went from reel to reel. The recordings themselves bypassed the recording on the set, but from reel to reel to a certain kind of very early kind of uh, digital recording after that. And one of the things I think we really must do is we must get this entire um, thing properly our archive and really save those reel to reel recordings and, and get them both on maybe. CDs and also well onto some hard drives, and we just have have all of them. Um, I actually first, just real quickly on me, I first had any knowledge, exact knowledge of the Winston Salem Symphony in 1991. I was working in my very first job. I was the chorus master at Brevard Music Center, which Tim mentioned. I had been a student at Brevard in the early in the 80s, and I was back as the chorus master, one of the opera conductors, and preparing the chorus for all the choral works. And um, I went. I had a very close friend who I've mentioned her to some of you before. She lived to be 106 years old. She died in 2005, age 106. So back in 91, she was 91, 92 years old. And her name was Nan Burt, a big patron of the Brevard Music Center. And we had a lot of summer evenings sitting on her porch, drinking a beverage of some sort, and looking out over the scenery over the mountains and sort of solving all the world's problems. And I remember once she said, ah, come on up to the porch. There's, uh, there's a professional conductor and you need to meet these professional conductors. We've got the, a man named Peter Pere is going to be on my porch this evening. He's here visiting. So I went up and I met Peter and I remember after thinking, oh, I just met a professional conductor of a professional <laughs> orchestra. Never crossed my mind that, you know, 12, 13 years later, I'd be the music director of that orchestra. Um, 2004 um, ish around then, Peter they announced Peter was leaving the orchestra, and I threw my hat in the ring. I, I, I'm from South Carolina, but I'd, I'd gone to school in New York and then lived in Austria, and I worked in Indiana. And at the time, I was in an orchestra in Arizona, I was with the Phoenix Symphony. And so I just threw my hat in the ring. I mean, I just put a resume out, and somehow of the 200 resumes they received, I made it into the finals, and I was one of the five finalists to come conduct. I did the first concert, and the story I was going to tell is that uh, they had they had audience surveys, so everyone in the audience could also fill out a survey on each candidate and tell what they thought. And I have now one of my uh, you know treasured pieces is a survey, and the person wrote at the bottom, you know, you really should stop the search now. You should hire Bob Moody. This is exactly the right choice. And then they signed it. Signed, Martha Moody, his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Mom, if you do that, don't sign the name. <laughs> but it worked out. I got the job. And um, <laughs> so, um, and if you that that long time ago era, twelve years ago, we went through a couple of years where we sort of talked about conducting electricity. If you recall, that was sort of our our. Um, driving marketing push that actually goes to my sister. I will say my older sister Donna came up with that idea, which caused me to do something I never expected at conservatory, take a whole photo shoot with me climbing up on a telephone pole, hanging off, and then have lightning coming out of my baton and the ass conducting electricity. So um, it's been a great experience for me. It's been a phenomenal 12 years. I wanted just to sort of finish up by asking if, if any of you have any specific any specific concert memory, um, I will tell you one, uh, the concert memory that, that uh, not, a, not an inspirational one, a funny one that comes to mind is we were doing Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, and this is back in a time when our Saturday night series, the Kicked Back Classic series, we only did one hour. Now we do the entire concert that's also on the Sunday and Tuesday Classics, but then we were just doing a one hour concert kind of a Reader's Digest. So we might not do the overture on Saturday night. We might just do one or two movements of the concerto and one or two movements of the symphony. And we had decided that we were going to just do the um, second, third, and fourth movements, I think, of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. We were going to do the first movement. And so I came bounding out to start the concert. I bow, I turn around. In my mind, I start conducting the first movement of the, of the Beethoven Seventh. They start playing the second movement, and I have this, it's like the panic dream you have. It's like the dream of that you show up somewhere in your underwear. I'm suddenly thinking, what has happened? And my ears couldn't even make out what they were playing. I thought, what are they playing? I, have I forgotten a piece? And so I sort of had to stop them, 
the whole thing probably took three seconds in my mind. It took five minutes, but I stopped and I was like, oh yes, we're starting the second movement. And then I started. So a lot of the players remember this. And just a couple of years ago, we had a rehearsal that fell on a very specific day. And actually Ron's colleague, partner in crime, Anthony Taylor, our principal clarinet, I, I now know was the one who instigated this. But it was just, it was a rehearsal, dress rehearsal. Um, but I went to start and as I, as I started, again, the orchestra was playing the wrong piece. And I had a moment of total panic. And we had, I remember we had an audience. And I thought, what have I done? Well, it turns out they were playing Happy Birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was all Anthony sort of doing to make that happen. But it's amazing how long it takes your brain to figure out that tune is Happy Birthday. <laughs> your first thoughts are, I've got the wrong piece of music. What's going on? <laughs> Anyone, any, any sort of... Um, Thoughts about the. I, I actually have something, it's not on the anchor that it went down, a funny end of it, but I will say um, I've been in the orchestra long enough where a lot of my colleagues have passed away, and one specific instance was when a man named Richard Norman used to play second trumpet with me. He always said he was wanting to never play first trumpet, he wanted to always play second. And one of the reasons he played in the orchestra was because he and I got along so well. He was a tall guy, really big guy, about six five, really huge guy, played with the most amazing sound ever. And he had the biggest notes on the bottom of a horn I've ever heard in my life. It was a great experience for me. Peter Perry was conducting, and um, Richard and I were just like this. And when you sit beside the someone in this orchestra, or even in the section, or even as a family unit within the orchestra, you learn a lot about the players, family life, their history, and everything that's going on in their life. And you try to put all that aside when you come to play a concert. Well, one day, Richard and we had a rehearsal in the morning from 10 to 12.30, and he was on the orchestra committee, and that afternoon, he went and stayed at the hotel because he lived in Lenore. So he would stay in the hotel overnight because the rehearsal would be the night before. He went to the hotel that afternoon, went to brush his teeth, and blood came out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And this is a Saturday, a Saturday afternoon, we had a Saturday night concert. We had a, a Sunday afternoon concert and a Tuesday night concert. He he was in the hospital that night. He passed away on Monday morning. Marie Wallace, who was the personnel manager at the time, ran into my house without even knocking, and she said his heart couldn't take it. I had two options. I either could say I was not going to play the concert on Tuesday night, or I went and played. Peter Perret, in the paper the next day, and I'm, probably some of you remember this, Peter Perret had told the, the, the person who was writing the review that if he had looked at me, because I cried through the entire time, he was right behind my piano concert number two, I'll never forget it. Every time we play it, I still remember that. He said if he had looked back at me during that moment, he could not have carried on as a conductor. He said he would have been in tears to watch me be so upset. And ever since then, there's been several friends of mine who have passed away. I played the next day with my dad and died. So there's a lot of, lot of things like that that the audience doesn't know about when they look at the orchestra trying to put everything that happened to it. And most of us, because of our experiences, whether we're happy or sad, we give 150% of everything we have in our hearts to, sh to, show the, 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 or to show ourselves, to show humanity that there is good in music. And it's just, that's one of my stories. That, I mean, again, I can tell you me, you know, but that's just something that affects you as a musician on stage. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because a lot of the audience probably can't perceive how much communication is going on during a concert. Literally during a concert. Um, I, I know this, this, this last night having a concert was just incredible. I think, I think everybody on stage it, it was, was just thrilled. And I, I guarantee you, you and I met eyes at least 24, 35 times. You know, there's so much communication going on, even between people that are sitting down this way from you. Um, and it's kind of neat to it's kind of neat to see. It's, it's neat to be a part of it for sure. Um, but I always know at, at, I'll bring people to concerts and look at oh, that sounded nice and, and, and they truly enjoy it. But I don't think they understand quite how much of a, a team effort it really is. Um, one of the things that I think makes this orchestra as strong as it is for the the size town it is is I think a lot of these bigger orchestras. Um, the same ones who might be going through financial troubles trying to sustain that, that size of orchestra. 
I think they, they might change personnel so much that you don't ever get that sort of bond. Don't get me wrong, a great player could come and sit in the horn section, and the horn section would sound great because he's a great player. You're not really even talking about skill level as much as the, the, the just the sort of teamwork that comes together in an orchestra. And, and when you've been playing with the same people for as long as you have, or as long as some of us have, it, it's just kind of neat to see it play out. So. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. So any, any thoughts? You gentlemen? Yep. Well, it's interesting. I consider myself a fairly good violinist, but I always oh, dream that to be a cellist. Oh my God! Oh, okay. <laughs> I always wanted to be a cellist. In fact, I, I always thought that's the most wonderful instrument of all. So, simply getting artists to play the cello has always been the time that I've been mostly in love with the symphony. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to agree with you there, but I think the cello might just be the greatest <laughs> single instrument invented. And, and certainly, if we're going to talk about inspirational memories, I, I, in the, as, as, at the, as I'm looking back on my life, at whatever that's this coming to an end, I think one of the memories I will have is Yo-Yo Ma saying to me, what would you like for the encore? And then playing the Bach, uh, G major prelude, just like looking at me the whole time. I was, I, I, I had goosebumps on top of goosebumps. That was, I'll never forget that moment. Ron? I just remember when Renee Fleming came out for the second half in that emerald green dress. <laughs> and I followed her out and I thought, I'm not going to be able to play my part. <laughs> Look at this beautiful woman in this gorgeous dress and, and hear that voice. That was pretty amazing. Um, speaking of the cello, uh, since we're getting towards the end here, I'll put in a plug for another institution which is related to the symphony, and that is the opera is going on uh, this weekend. Friday night is opening night, Sunday afternoon, and then Tuesday night, and this is Tosca, and it doesn't get better than Puccini. Right. And since he mentioned the cello, there is a cello quartet uh, in this piece where the principal cello is going way up high, and it's in Four-part harmony and a little bit of counterpoint between the form. It's just an absolutely gorgeous uh, thing. I mean, a string quartet uh, is probably the most expressive of all chamber groups. But when you have one instrument that can do the entire range, which is the cello, because violins can't play that low, uh, it's, a, it's a, an amazing thing. So uh, we're all in the pen. Uh, come, come and see the opera. Get a chance. Yeah, you know, the Winston Salem Symphony is the or is the orchestra of Piedmont Opera, and we're incredibly proud of that relationship. As Ron and others alluded, we are incredibly proud of the relationship um, that we have with the North Carolina School of the Arts. And you know, in, in the stories, I was able to be here for the last uh, about three years of the nearly forty-year Nutcracker tradition. And if if you want to talk about shenanigans, you should have been in the pit sometimes during Nutcracker performances. Some of the things that happen, we maybe should just never tell. <laughs> My favorite Nutcracker experience, uh, and this involves Emilia Soto. Um, she she has the solo, in, uh, the chocolate solo, uh, nailed it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard you nail that solo. Uh, well over a hundred times, and I don't remember which year it was. And I want to say it was Eric Sol's game. It was. That was Right after her solo. No, right before. Right before. Oh, it was before. That's right. That's right. I, we hear this commotion from, from down a little further down the pit. Chocolate bars are everywhere. <laughs> he dumped a bag of candy on the back. That's the I didn't actually see it happen. I just heard it. And then she's got to come in and play this solo. There, there were plenty of funny Nutcracker yeah. stories, um, but, that, but that's, that's a good clean one. So. Yeah. I, I, I guess I can tell the one. The, the, well, my first year, and it was maybe the second performance, maybe the third performance, um, we get to Arabian. And one of our bassists at the time, a guy named Joe Farley, uh, who was a, a, a larger gentleman, had pulled his shirt out to reveal his very large hairy belly, and he was doing the Arabian dance with his face drag across his face like a veil. I pretty much had to stop from that. <laughs> so like I said, there's shenanigans in the fit that, you know. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, I know we, we need to bring it to a close, but I, I did want to say that I, I think that uh, a couple of these guys have alluded to the, the, what I find to be, I think, the singular strength of the orchestra. Yes, 
there's no doubt that the relationship and the, and the existence of the North Carolina School of the Arts is, is one of the key factors that brings this orchestra to a higher level than many a community, um, anything like this anywhere in the country. I mean, we, we um, a, a, as, as the, the artistic administrator of the North Carolina Symphony, which is the largest professional orchestra in the state of North Carolina, came to the Beethoven 9, and um, he, shaking my hand afterwards, he said, wow, your orchestra really punches above its weight, doesn't it? And he's exactly right. I mean, this orchestra just has, I, I will tell you another, um, another orchestra that's a larger budget than ours that is, that is in our vicinity. And, and at one point, the music director said to the staff, um, have you heard the recordings of the Winston-Salem Symphony on the radio? Said, I heard something on performance today. It was the Winston Sam Symphony, and they said, "Yeah." They said, "Well, he said, well, we should pay attention because they're playing better than we are right now." So I think they're just these are so only anecdotes, but I think this is absolute truth that this orchestra punches above its weight. It, it exists at a higher level than the city would indicate. I, I, I think the one of the strongest reasons for that is that the players who are sitting on that stage have immense to the point of really music familial respect and belief in each other. And it feels much more like a positive family of devoted music makers than I've experienced in, in any orchestra I've conducted anywhere else. And I, I think that is something that, that people are aware of in the orchestra and they work to hold on to. It's not that any orchestra is all, you know, all orchestras are full of bureaucracy and intrigue and we all have our stories over time, but on the whole, boy oh boy, you have a sense on the stage that everyone is dedicated to each other, to the art, to understanding we've got a reputation, and that it's, it's important to uphold that, and the familiarity with each other is a key. They know how to play together because they know how to breathe together, because they have laughed together, because we have been to bruise with Bob or, you know, Carl's uh, cookouts at his house. We have, we have done these things together, and that's an incredibly important part. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to these uh, former and current members of the orchestra and here's to 70 more years of the Winston-Salem Symphony.